Welcome to the next interview for AATRN, the Applied Algebraic Topology Research Network. Applied topology is a research area with a strong sense of community, and AATRN has been working hard to try to keep it that way during the pandemic. So thanks to all of you for joining. Within our community, we have a lot of knowledge, not only about research, but also about professional development. And the goal of this interview series is to hear, learn from, and celebrate our community stories. So our interviewer today, i.e. the person asking the questions, is Professor Catherine Turner. So Professor Turner received her doctorate at the University of Chicago, advised by Dr. Weinberger and Dr. Uh, Lekhung Lim. After a postdoc at EPFL in Lausanne, Switzerland, she returned home to Australia, where she is currently a senior lecturer at, at the Mathematical Sciences Institute of the Australian National University. Her research expertise is in topological transforms, statistics and applied topology, and topological reconstruction. She's particularly well known for her work on probabilistic and statistical aspects of the space of persistence diagrams and the development of the persistent homology transform, among other things. Thank you, Professor Turner, for hosting our interview today. Well, thank you very much. All right. Um, and it's my honor to introduce my supervisor, Schmuel Weinberger. So a bit of background, even though he's going to probably cover this in the interview as well. So he did his undergrad and his PhD concurrently at the New York University under the direction of Sylvan Kapal. Uh, he spent some time at a variety of universities, including Princeton and the University of Pennsylvania, but most of his research life has been at the University of Chicago, where he is currently the Andrew McLeish Professor of Mathematics, okay? So he is a very celebrated mathematician, a fellow of both the American Mathematical Society and the American Academy for the Advancement of Science. Uh, Schmuel's research is on geometry and topology very broadly defined, um, but I would argue that perhaps most recently there's been quite a focus on quantitative and applied topology. Uh, so he's got a really interesting mix of mathematics with high impact research. Uh, besides important mathematical contributions, Schmuel is also an exemplary citizen of the mathematical community. Um, he is currently chair at the maths department at the University of Chicago, uh, where I have heard amongst the graduate students that he has the epithet Schmuel the Generous. Uh, he is on countless advisory boards and journal editorial boards. And in particular for this community, uh, plays, played an important role as founding editor in chief for the Journal of Applied and Computational Topology. So thank you, Shmuel, for joining us. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, I, a, it's an honor to be interviewed. I, and it's actually great looking at who are the, some of the people here. I mean, I see, I see the names of a bunch of old friends and I, uh, when we turn off the cameras, I look forward to chatting in the after chat with, with people. Uh, anyway. All right, so let's start the interview sort of somewhat um, biographical. So could you sort of talk us through when and how you first became serious about studying mathematics? Can you tell us your origin story? Ah, okay. I mean, you're only getting one question, Kate, but I'll just go on. Uh, so let's see, it's all my brother's fault. I mean, uh, I have an older brother. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, my older brother is eight years older than I am. And when I was, uh, I always admired him and whatever he was interested in, I was interested in, in copying. And when he was an undergraduate, he was a physics major. Uh, so I don't know, I was somewhere in middle school. And I mean, he had me try to read his physics book. So like I would read, scroll pitchfork star pitchfork which of course you know is the integral of the you know i mean it's the l2 norm of some eigenfunction psi uh but anyway you know and you know my brother thought this was hysterical i mean you know you know little brother tricks uh but anyway i, I thought it was really cool and i thought that someday i'd want to do physics uh but my brother warned me that i'd have to learn math so i began learning math and i never learned enough math to be able to do physics so that was what a, well, a, I don't know about that. I mean, at some point or other, I was enjoying the math and I stopped uh, looking for uh, the applications. Uh, you know, I mean, at some key uh, moment, I read Hardy's apology and I thought, wow, that's really inspiring. You know, anything with applications is terrible. I'm really interested in the things that are true in all universes, not necessarily the, the one we happen 
uh, to inhabit. So I, you know, uh, became a very pure mathematician uh, for uh, most of my early life. Uh, but anyway, so uh, so when I got to high school, I finally had an opportunity to begin, you know, doing math seriously. Uh, they, they quickly gave me a calculus book to read. And while I was in high school, I more or less studied in, in a pretty crappy way, the undergraduate math curriculum. Uh, more or less by reading on my own. Um, although there was a very, very kind and good analyst, uh, Donald Newman, who was associated with Yeshiva University at the time, uh, he would talk to me each week. He was great with problems. I mean, you know, lots and lots of Olympiad style problems and I would do like 0% of them and he was very encouraging. Um, anyway, so yeah, no, so that was how I more or less spent high school. In my last year of high school, I, I, w I sort of had the gumption to uh, go to Columbia to sit in on a course. And the only course that fit in with my schedule was a course that Eilenberg was giving in algebraic topology. Uh, so I went to that course and I thought I would go to Columbia because that was where my brother was an undergraduate and I wanted to do whatever my brother did. So there I was, my last year in high school, doing algebraic topology with Eilenberg, finding it really bewildering and working really, really hard. And I, I think that that's sort of one of the wonderful things about math, that just about anything which you work hard on, after a while becomes interesting. I mean, I, at the beginning, I, you know, just couldn't, you know, I didn't at all figure out the point. And uh, let me make a comment that what I learned in that year and now with, with Eilenberg, is a proper subset of what I cover nowadays in a nine-week course uh, that's required of our first-year graduate students. And I really think, I mean, it's one of the things that worries me, I mean, that we really uh, push a lot in a very high-pressured way on students. Anyway, end of editorial. Um, where was I? I, oh, I was finishing high school. I was finishing high school and I wanted to go to Columbia. It turns out I couldn't afford Columbia. Uh, I, I came from a pretty lower middle class family and I did not succeed in getting um, a scholarship. Uh, so again, I had the chutzpah, I called up Harold Shapiro, who was a number theorist at, uh, at, at Courant. Uh, I had met Harold at a meeting of the MAA, the Math Association of America. I, I had taken the Putnam exam and done poorly, but well enough to get some recognition. So I went to an MAA meeting and I met Harold a few days earlier. And then all of a sudden I, you know, called him up essentially crying, saying, I can't afford to go to college. And he, he said, well, let me talk to Peter Lax. And he introduced me to Peter Lax a few days later. And NYU accepted me with open arms. They gave me a full scholarship. Told me, don't worry about it. We'll put you in a BA PhD program. You'll, it'll all work out. Don't worry about it. And I was grateful. And I went to NYU and I think it was, it was really, really good for me. And again, another aspect of things were better in the olden days. I don't think all things were better in the olden days, but uh, you know, it might sound like that, but I'm really grateful. And I don't know that, you know, that this kind of thing is so doable nowadays of just like a kid calling up a faculty member at a university and then the university arranging to do, you know, what I feel was an extraordinary uh, kindness to me. So that probably finished. Kate, are you? Muted? Yep, no, that's good. Um, so I guess sort of still sticking with um, Courant. Um, so your, um, re your relationship with your advisor, how did that start? What was it like? What is it now? It's in a pretty important part of your mathematical life. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, Sylvan is terrific, okay? Um, he got an award from the American Math Society for being a wonderful humanitarian. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, yeah, he's a hard act to follow. And in fact, I always feel guilty that I've never given to a single one of my students the things I've gotten from him. Okay. I, um, so I met Sylvan for the first time when I was 14. Uh, I went to a talk that Erdish was giving at Courant because it seemed like a thing to do. I mean, Erdich's talk was something like some problems and for 60 minutes, 
he talked about 120 problems or something because, you know, he, he talked fast and, you know, whatever. It was sort of, it was an interesting experience. Uh, and then uh, afterwards, you know, there were a lot of people who wanted to talk to Erdős. I talked to him about some really dumb ideas about uh, things in the direction of Roth theorem. Wow, I can't believe I remember what I talked to Erdős about, you know, a million years ago. Um, and I really don't remember what Sylvan talked to him about, but then Sylvan saw me and he kind of likes little kids uh, and, you know, pushing them scientifically. I mean, he's uh, mentored many high school students for Intel projects and, you know, stuff of that sort. Uh, so he was nice and friendly and chatted with me and so on. So when the following year I was, uh, I took, Peter Lax was recruiting me and he heard that I was taking Eilenberg's topology course. Um, Olax told me my first uh, off-color joke, which I think this is a great place to repeat. Um, hear what a, a National Medal of Science winner had to say. He said, what's the difference? Oh, one second. Oh, he told me, you don't really want to do topology. A topologist is someone who can't tell the difference between his ass and a hole in the wall. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah, I was you know pretty shocked at the use of the word ass um, at, in my very very uh, pristine sheltered fifteen year old no fourteen year old self. I'm losing track of exactly uh, when it was. It, yeah, it must have been it was before I started college. Anyway, so uh, but but he introduced me to Sylvan, uh, who you know who, who he thought would take care of me when I got to when I got to NYU, and indeed that's what happened. Uh, Sylvan became my advisor, both undergraduate and graduate advisor, uh, gave me lots of advice, uh, taught me enormous amounts. He is so enthusiastic about math. So uh, a typical thing would be that I'd arrange, an, uh, an, I would be curious about something, I'd uh, schedule an appointment with him, and he wouldn't show show up, you know, a half hour, an hour. I'd be sitting on the floor by the by his office door. Finally, he'd come and he'd say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm late. Uh, we'd come in and I'd ask him a question, which I thought was just a little question. And then he would talk math for about three, four hours. And I knew he had other things on his schedule afterwards. And like, I just thought, oh gosh, I don't know how late he's going to be to these things. Because like, it is, you know, I mean, but anyway, but he taught me a lot. I mean, he taught me... You know, he re, you know, he gave me the intuitions of algebraic topology rather than the formalities. And he, I remember him teaching me about characteristic classes and cobordism and surgery and, you know, just any kind of thing. And we'd go to seminars together. And then typically after a seminar, we'd have conversations about what was discussed. Uh, so it was very broad ranging. Um, if you know Sylvan, I mean, you can guess that they weren't only mathematical conversations. He can get off on tangents and then the tangents have tangents. Uh, he's not a chain complex, uh, so you know, uh, you know, you just move on. And it was very erudite, talked about history and culture and literature. Uh, but anyway, uh, so anyway, so that was, you know, that started. I don't know, forty years ago, more than forty years ago. Uh, and you know, we we nowadays tend to talk most weeks. He and I are still doing joint work. I think we've written around fifteen papers together over the over the years. Uh, and uh, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, fantastic relationship. I mean, he did a lot for me. He does a lot for me. I have a lot of fun. All right. Um, uh, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, going to stay in the early years for a little bit longer. Uh, can you tell us how you ended up at the University of Chicago? Ah, yes, I can. Um, let's see, my, my first job af after I got my degree was, um, at, was at Princeton. Um, and yeah, so let me think about exactly how to say that. So anyway, so, you know, so that was fine. I went to Princeton. It was, an, it was an, a really amazing experience there. I remember the first couple of weeks, I was just going to seminars and courses. And I, you know, and I was, I, you know, there was so much homotopy theory going on. Uh, Nick Kuhn was, had the office right across the hall from me. Um, you know, there was Bill Browder and John Moore and Bill Thurston, and I was going to Thurston's class. And I realized that I ha did not have even a moment to have a single thought of my own because there was just so much going on. 
and that I had to go cold turkey. Um, and I think I cut out everything except for the weekly seminars at the university, um, the institute, and Thurston's class. So, uh, so you know, that was what I did uh, together with my teaching. Um, and, you know, just loved it. It was a fantastic experience for me. It was also my first time living away from home. Um, and the summer between my first and second years at Princeton, I was invited to my first conference. Uh, and I was, somehow I got to give, you know, uh, one of the bigger talks. And in the audience was Wu Chung Chang, my chairman at Princeton. And he really took offense at my talk and, you know, and he asked some question and then he said, you know, said, ah, all this stuff. And, you know, firstly, he said it was due to a student of his. Then he said it was all wrong. Then he said it was no good. I mean, he just had a really hard time with my talk. I and mean, uh, we, you know, I mean, he was a very volatile fellow. Uh, so Mel Rothenberg, who was uh, at University of Chicago, uh, a man who became ultimately a very close friend of mine, uh, was in the audience and uh, this was back in the days where one did a lot of conference traveling. So, um, so there was that conference one week, the following week there was another conference and in between Mel went back to Chicago and he said that, oh, I met this young guy Shmuel and I don't think he's gonna really enjoy staying at Princeton. I think that, you know, and he got his colleagues to agree to make me an offer if I applied. Uh, so he told me this, and I then applied in the fall. And it was, again, it was just like similar to like Peter Lax deciding that, oh, let's go ahead and, you know, be nice to Shmuel. Um, you know, I guess they figured that if Peter Lax was nice to me and Wu Chung wasn't, they should be nice to me, you know, to sort of even up the karma. Uh, so anyway, so that was it. I mean, I, you know, uh, the following year in the fall, I applied, and then I, I came to Chicago. Um, in the fall uh, as an assistant professor. Uh, yeah, and then Chicago, uh, yeah, the, I, so it, it was so wonderful. I mean, I, I remember just being shocked that I was there because um, I had the feeling that I, w I didn't really have that much confidence that I was gonna end up doing math. I mean, math seemed really hard and I really admired a lot of the people who I was surrounded by. Um, I, you know, and I saw people whose names had already made it into textbooks and stuff like that. So like when I got to Chicago, I mean, I, you know, there was Lashoff and Rothenberg and Peter May in topology. Um, and I don't know, there was Bob Zimmer and, you know, and Dick Swan. And I just didn't think I really belonged there. I thought, wow, this is really lucky. And that in a few years, I'll probably end up going to medical school, which is what my mother wanted me to do. And my mother kept on telling me uh, when the MCATs were being given and stuff like that, you know, recommending that I take a class in organic chemistry so that I, you know, beef up my transcript so I could really get into medical school. So that's what I thought. I thought I'd do math till I conked out um, and that it was gonna come sooner or later. Um, so anyway, during my first year in Chicago, I got an offer from Rutgers and I thought, I mean, it was a tenured offer, which was, I thought on the one hand, premature. On the other hand, I was delighted. And I thought, Rutgers, wow, that's really fantastic. Pe um, Julia Shanison is there, uh, Ted Petrie, Peter Landweber, Norm Levitt. And it's not that far from Princeton where there's all this other great stuff going on. This is my dream job. And I, you know, walked into Peter May's office. Peter was chair at the time. And I told him I have this offer from Rutgers. And he told me to turn it down. And I told him that, no, I'm gonna accept it. It's really the right thing for me. And he said, no, don't worry. You're gonna get tenure here down the line. I'm quite sure of it. And I told him, no, you just, you know, last year you decided to hire me and this year I'm here and you're not gonna admit your mistake right away. And you don't know me, but in a few years from now, you'll know me better and you'll find the excuse to kick me out and, and you'll be right. And that'll be fine. I should leave now when I have this opportunity. Uh, so again, I then just lucked out. My colleagues at Chicago decided to take a risk uh, and they you tenured me my first year there. So I, it's again, I, and I ha uh, for many years, I had sort of overwhelming gratitude uh, to the generosity of my department. Uh, after having been chair though, I, I might be a little more cynical <laughs> about things. 
uh, or it might be more nuanced, but uh, no, but it definitely was the case that it was very welcoming and I was shocked that they did it. But again, I was delighted and, uh, you know, and I grew to like Chicago, despite it being a long commute to New York. And stuff like that. There are worse things than a long commute to New York. Okay, so I want to fast forward a bit and ask you how your journey into applied topology happened. <sighs> okay. That's a longer story, uh, but it's... Okay, I want to blame my friends. This time I'm not going to blame, you know, my brother. Uh, <laughs> let, me, let me blame my friends, because I have a whole bunch of good friends. Uh, and again, if I were going to pontificate and give advice, I'd say really get good collaborators. I mean, and I've learned enormous amounts from different collaborators of mine. Uh, and um, my trip into, yeah, into applied topology is really um, a whole bunch of people, you know, telling me and asking me interesting things and me getting into conversations and so on and so forth. Um, so probably the most direct route was, uh, firstly, I had done a lot of work on stratified spaces. The stuff on stratified spaces uh, comes out of group actions. If you have a group that's acting freely, the quotient is a manifold. If the action has fixed points, then the quotient uh, is a stratified space. Now, uh, the problem in topology is, say, in surgery theory, one of the things you do is you try to understand you know, say the classification of manifolds. If you'd want to study the classification of manifolds with a group action, you want to study stratified spaces. So the question is, how can you study stratified spaces? How do you understand the singularities? So one approach goes like this. I'll phrase it more modernly. You take your space with singularities, you remove the singularities, and give it, a very, give it some metric where the large scale geometry of the metric will compactify to the original stratified space. Okay, so, you know, if it just had a point singularity, you could imagine removing that point and then taking the neighborhood and stretching out this little open cone and stretching it out to be the manifold cross array or something like that, right? So that would be a way of handling point singularities and generally do something more uh, complicated. Uh, and, and then what you want to do is just redo all of topology together with keeping track of a metric. Okay, so that you don't want to allow your metric constructions to be very large. So this is a way of studying stratified spaces. Uh, so I got kind of in, very interested in metric geometry. Um, so that was sort of one thing. One of the theorems that I really admired most from the 20th century is a theorem of Chapman and Ferry. I'll tell you Ferry's version of it. Okay, it goes like this. Suppose I have a manifold, okay? And I have a manifold with a metric. And suppose that I have the following weird thing. My manifold has a map to another manifold. We don't even know what the dimension of the target manifold is, but it better not be larger than the dimension of the domain. Okay, and here's what you know. There's some, you know, you know that the inverse image of every point is tiny. It's like, le it's less than 0.01 angstrom, right? It's some really, really tiny number. And Steve says that if that's what you could achieve, of course I'm lying because you know that 0.01 angstrom depends on the metric. But anyway, uh, it, suppose that all the point inverses are really tiny. Then Steve's theorem is that then your manifold, that map can be deformed to a homeomorphism. So if the diameter of every point inverse were zero, right? So if you have a manifold, and every point inverse has diameter zero, that would mean it's an embedding. So if the dimension of the target is at most as big, right? Then it better actually be exactly the same. And then, you know, M will be embedded in the other guy. So if it's connected, you know it's a homeomorphism. So this is saying that you could change the homeomorphism condition, which is absolutely beautiful and we all love, but that's not something that you could see on, under a microscope. You only have some resolution. You can't tell whether the inverse image of, the, is, of a point has diameter zero. You might only be able to tell 0.01, and Steve says that's good enough, okay? So I think I've said it in a way that makes it sound very computational, but at the time it was very theory-oriented. Uh, you might want to I stated the theorem in a little more generality than it was known. You should see that that implies the Poincaré conjecture. 
Okay, I mean, I'm not going to share a screen and give you the argument, but uh, it does imply the Poincaré conjecture. So at the time Steve proved that theorem, it was only in dimension five and higher. This was a, just an amazing theorem. Lots and lots, a, um, almost everything we now know about the Borel conjecture, about lots of things in topology grow out of that kind of theme. So measuring topo doing topology with estimates on size has all sorts of good reasons related to singularities, related to the Novikov conjecture, Borel conjecture, and rigidity to be interested in. So it just is sort of a natural thing to do, and it sounds very applied. So um, Steve Smale, another friend. Uh, so Smale, um, so Toyota was very kind and uh, created a, a technological institute in, in uh, that ended up in Chicago. There are two TTIs, Toyota Technological Institutes, one in Chicago, one in Japan. The one in Chicago uh, focuses on computer science kind of things. Uh, and, you know, they got going with a bang and they hired Steve Smale as one of their initial hires. Um, they didn't have any space of their own. So early on, Steve got a, an office in the math department uh, before Toyota was able to have its own digs. Uh, so somehow Steve ran into some of the things that I, that I was uh, doing. And, you know, he was in, interested in the stuff that ultimately became the paper that he and Parth and the Yogi and I wrote. And that is very similar in spirit about you know, you, under, you understand manifolds at a certain scale and you're trying to go ahead and figure out the manifold. It's, it, in fact, it sounds like that's really what Steve's theorem is about, except that Yogi Smell Weinberger is like 10 steps back because it's only the homotopy type while, you know, Steve got the homeomorphism type. Um, so anyway, so that was one of the roots. And I could tell you a different story, I mean, which was um, about a collaboration that I had with Alex Nabokovsky, which was, which, it turns out that we were studying the persistent homology of the space of Riemannian metrics, uh, where the filter function was the diameter. I mean, it was some crazy project of that. I won't tell you why, but it was sort of, you know, really interesting and involved mathematical logic and all sorts of weird things. And I was, and I gave some talk about that at Urbana, and because of, and somehow. Um, Rob Greist was there and Rob asked me to join him in some DARPA project that he was organizing called Stomp, uh, which had to do sensory topology and, and motion planning. And, you know, so then that got me involved with robotics. So I don't remember which thing happened first anymore. Basically, I began doing applied topology because really, you know, because people sold it to me. I just admired Smale so much. Rob was just convincing, oh, you know, there are going to be cool questions and you're going to enjoy them. And he was right. I mean, it was fantastic. And, you know, I mean, yeah, so that's basically it. I mean, I got into it for sort of two reasons. I mean, it really was intellectually right in the next door, but I don't know that I would have noticed it, you know, if I didn't have friends who were guiding me there, so. The importance of collaborators. Yeah. Um, okay, so on a slightly different um, uh, focus, I want to talk about sort of your role beyond mathematical theory. So I view you as someone who's a very active citizen in the mathematical community. You know, you had roles in institutions and in journals. Um, I was just wondering whether or not you could tell us what you've previously and currently been involved in and what motivates you. I've always wanted to be a good boy. That my mother told me. She always told me, be a good boy. And, uh, you know, and that's kind of the motive. You know, that's somehow it. I mean, I really, I mean, um, and as I've been getting older, my capacity at proving theorems isn't, I don't know whether it's not, a, you know, as intense as it once was or whether other aspects you know, have begun meaning more to me, but I realize that there's absolutely a lot that needs to be done to keep the mathematical community going and that, uh, you know, things will fall apart, you know. So let me just say, I think that everybody, you know, all, you know, really does a lot of stuff besides their research, okay? People referee papers, they write review articles, 
you know, you might edit a volume. Um, and all of these things are really, really important. And uh, in men, and a lot of them are pretty thankless, but the community really depends on it. And um, so, a, so it's sort of each thing, you know, I have to say that each thing I got into was sort of me be, firstly being somewhat selfish and being optimistic in stupid ways about what my benefits uh, from doing these kind of things might be. I mean, I remember that when I started being, before I became chair, I did it a bit out of uh, obligation. I was voted chair when I was away at Berkeley at a, um, uh, you know, for a semester. And I had already been at Chicago at that point, 20 or 30 years, and, and I just felt that I couldn't say no, so I didn't. But I had this idea that, oh, if I'm chair, you know, I, and, you know, all the Dixons are going to come to me with their problems. And that part was right. But, but I thought they were going to come to me with their math problems and I'd learn everything. And I'd, you know, learn some analysis and number theory. It was going to be fantastic. And it, that part turned out, turned out to be wrong. Um, but, but I do think that this is sort of something that one can do that does have impact. Um, and it's satisfying in a different way than proving theorems. Um, it's also a... Um, uh, let's see, what's the delicate way to say this? Well, I never felt that I was working until I became a chairman. That was when I first felt that I had a job. Uh, you know, you know, I, uh, yeah, it's definitely not always fun. I, uh, I remember some occasion where I had two very strong-willed colleagues, and I real and. And they were having this big furious fight, which like most things in academia was about absolutely nothing. And I figured out the solution, which was basically to, you know, make a definition. And then they were both in agreement because there was nothing they were disagreeing about. And they both agreed to it. And I thought, wow, I broke her to peace. I felt like, you know, um, Nobel Prize material there. And then the next day, one of them noticed and felt disrespected and like now was in a fight with both the other guy and with me. Uh, so um, it, it's sort of demanding that way. But on the other hand, I, I, you know, there are things that you can do. There are problems that you could solve. When you see a bigger picture, you could discover that, oh, people think they want X, but they could really live with X over two plus Z. And Z you could borrow from someone who has some Z and doesn't need it. You know, there's sort of, um, you know, it takes a lot of energy, but there's a satisfaction in, uh, in having things go. Uh, there's also the pain when you can't solve the problem. I mean, we're perennially uh, behind uh, things with that. Um, with journals, it's sort of a, a different thing. I'm the editor of a whole bunch of different journals. Uh, they're each really different in terms of which community they reach and what their role is. Um, so like I'm on the editorial board of FOCUM, um, which I won't pronounce the way that you know I sometimes do. Um, the way or, you taught me. Yeah, you know, and jam. <laughs> uh, but uh, APC, APCT, yes, that is, those are the right initials. Uh, Applied and Computational Topology. There um, is, you know, I mean, I got the, Claim the name of being the uh, initial editor in chief, uh, which is true. I mean, that is what I was. Um, but uh, pretty much the other members of the of the scientific board were there before me. Uh, you know, and they asked me whether I was interested in this. And it was obvious that our community needed a journal. Okay, I mean, there were some very very fine papers, and nowadays there are things that might get into annals of probability, but back in the olden days, it just wasn't, you know, it, it wasn't clear to the editors in probability journals that uh, the questions that come up naturally, say from TDA, um, are of interest. So there's sort of a whole bunch of combination of things. It was also clear that algebraic uh, applied topology is broader than just TDA and includes some things in robotics and in signal processing. I mean, you know, lots and lots of different areas. Um, are, are open uh, to this kind of thing. Um, and there were good papers not being accepted. And we thought that it would be a good idea to have a journal that has um, high standards, 
that would be really application focused, that it wasn't, you know, on the one hand, it, we wanted it to be a serious math journal, right? That, the, you know, not just, you know, um, you know, experimental stuff or using math off the shelf. Um, and this is, of course, and, you know, on the other hand, you know, we would be, we love brand new applications, you know, of things that didn't exist before. And so we wanted to keep, have two different criteria in mind simultaneously. So we wanted the papers not just to be, oh, here is a model that's already out there. Let's, um, you know, let's study its properties, even though, you know, you're studying at a level of refinement where the original modeling gives you no reason to believe that that level of refinement has any value. Okay, right. I mean, there are certainly, you know, lots and lots of, and a lot of that stuff is really fine and excellent mathematics, and I'm not putting it down. And that's what math journal, you know, ordinary pure math journals, I think, are for. Um, but we wanted, but we really, we had an, uh, an ideological axe to grind. We believe that topology really could shed some light on applications, and that we, and that's what we wanted to showcase um, and foster. Uh, you know, so by fostering, I mean, there were a bunch of papers, for example, that went to APCT and that we sent to the science, that I, uh, that I sent to the scientific, oh, yeah, I didn't tell you how I became editor-in-chief. Uh, but anyway, uh, that, you know, that I would send to the scientific board and people said, oh, well, it doesn't really tell a plausible application story. It's a piece of mathematics. Or it would say, this is very, very applied, but it doesn't really explain, you know, what the mathematical depth is. And I... I mean, I went back and forth with authors and revisions and so on, uh, you know, many more rounds than I ever did uh, in any of the pure math journals that I, that I ran because, um, you know, I, we were trying and we are trying. I mean, we're trying to broaden this community wherever there's sort of a new application or, you know, some new piece of mathematics that's relevant to, you know, some already existing uh, method of analysis, but that, you know, but that is necessary and will really shed light on a, on a, on a story. You know, I mean, we, we want that to come into the journal and uh, stuff like that. Yeah. Now, the reason I became editor-in-chief was an accident. I mean, somehow we ended up with Springer as our publisher, and Springer did not like our very democratic uh, plan of, you know, the scientific board being some general board and making the manager, the editor do all the work and, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, they insisted that there be an editor in chief. And I kind of thought I was going to be a figurehead. So I, you know, so I got elected and, to, and then it turned out that it didn't work. I, uh, you know, it turns out that, you know, when you're the editor in chief, then you have to take responsibility. So I did it for a while. Um, I think that uh, I, I promised Springer, what did I promise? I think I promised them three years and I did five years, but I don't remember. I, and I'm not going to look out my contract. Um, and then I uh, was very happy to pa pass it on to Fred Chazal. I think Fred is a much better applied mathematician than I am. Uh, and he thinks about these problems deeply and he has broad knowledge and he's a very level-headed guy. So uh, it was fun, and I'm, I'm very proud of the journal. Um, I hope it succeeds in journal land to, like, say, the square root of what AAPRN is doing in social seminar land uh, for our community. Um, but, you know, that was why that one started. And I, you know, I, mean, I think that it's sort of a, a good thing. Uh, so anyway, that's two of the things, chairmanship, journals. I mean, I'm on some boards. I mean, I mean, yeah, so Simon's board, the Simon's Foundation. I like the Simon's Foundation. Uh, it's very well to do. Uh, and this is the one where I feel like I, um, you know, you know, like I said, when I was chairman, I thought I'd go and I'd just be intellectually stimulated all the time and that it was going to be a lot. It was going to be work, but that, oh, but I'd benefit from it. Well, that's the way that it is at the Simon's Foundation. Um, he sort of every meeting I go there, I learn interesting math or interesting science. I mean, it's a really, really fantastic place. Um, and it tries very hard to, to do good for the community. I don't know that I've helped, I mean, I've tried to help them, but I, I have no metric by which to measure whether I was useful to them. Uh, but 
I would say that that one, that one was as close to selfish as I could manage. I mean, I, I've been there. This is my fourth year on the board. I'm rotating out at the end of the year. Um, and it's been nothing but fun. I, well, that's not true. I mean, I have to say that when we go through proposal and we can only fund a certain percentage, there's always agony at the at the borderline. And I know the people, you know, and the people who make the processes, they of course always decide that the amount of funds we're going to give a certain project is exactly so that it's agony to do it at the at the boundary line because that way we're ensuring that we're maintaining quality. Uh, so it's sort of a brutal thing. It's sort of like evolutionary biology, you know. You go ahead and you improve species from, from the point of view of some fitness function at the cost of killing a lot of things. So yeah, there's a lot of pain. But I have to say that selfishly, not since they really never gave me very much money. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I never felt the pain of the of you know of that side. Uh, but it you know, but it's scientifically really a lot of fun. So I'd say that, that you know, I mean, some of the relationships I've had with various institutes uh, are intellectually a lot of fun. I mean, uh, to be involved in. And it also really broadens your, your mind. I mean, it's sort of second best to having good collaborators. You know, good collaborators teach you so much. Uh, and I'm feeling guilty that I'm not mentioning all my great collaborators because, and I'll, of course, then feel guilty afterwards because of the ones I skip. Uh, but and the other thing that they do is they energize you. You know, it's very hard to be peppy about things when things are going tough. Um, but anyway, but after good collaborators, you know, Finding some good way that you could contribute to the community in ways that don't involve your research ideas uh, working, I think that that's a very sane thing to do. And I think it would be really scary to be locked up in the Institute for Advanced Study. I mean, I'm willing to try, uh, but I, you know, but I, you know, but you know, but not having teaching and you know, not if you're not involved in the in the larger world, um, you know, then you're putting a lot of uh, psychological weight on your research. Um, so we have a little bit time to ask some more mathsy type questions. Um, so firstly, um, I think you would have an interesting perspective on the potential synergies between applied topology and pure mathematics. So uh, in particular, what are new directions uh, in pure mathematics that have stemmed or will potentially stem from applied topology? Okay, I'm, I can't tell you about brand new directions, et cetera, et cetera, but I could talk about, uh, you know, and I could talk of, you know, I could talk forever, as you know, uh, but I, uh, about these kind of things. I mean, after all, I came into applied topology because, um, as I said, some of the ideas in control topology, um, you know, are very, very natural to, you know, very similar to uh, reconstruction from data kind of problems. Uh, Persistent homology is sort of another nice example. I mean, like I said, Nabatusky and I were using persistent homology, but we didn't know it. Uh, we talked about having very, very deep local minima for these functionals, where nowadays what you would call a deep local minimum is you would say you'd have a, a long finite length persistent homology bar. Um, so persistent homology is, you know, kind of really useful. I think there are a lot of I think it's a fascinating direction to study the persistent homology of functions on various function spaces. Um, Polterovich and collaborators have done a lot of work in Hamiltonian dynamics and symplectic topology by studying the persistent homology of the action functional um, on, on, loop, um, on loop spaces. Um, um, oh, in my article on the notices, what is persistent homology? Because I thought I was talking to the typical readers of the notices are pure mathematicians. So I pointed out that if you look at pH zero of the free loop space of a manifold, uh, that, you know, with respect to log of the length of the curve, um, that, that's going to be, you'll have some barcode and it'll have a bunch of bars. And if you change the metric, um, you'll throw out some, bars of that mo the bar this barcode is of infinite length barcode uh, but view two infinite length barcodes as being equivalent if they're if they're finite distance from each other in you know in bottleneck distance uh, and then that turns out to be an invariant um, of the fundamental group so there there's a new invariant in geometric group theory uh, that's instantaneously definable 
Um, and you know, I think that that's something that's cool. And I pointed out that if the group has unsolvable word problem, then you have infinitely many bars of finite length that are larger than any fixed constant. Uh, and which is, by the way, part of a theme that I think should come that is existing nowadays also in applied topology. But it's a change in perspective of studying the the influence of short bars rather than just looking at the longer bars. Um, but if, you, if there are lots and lots of short bars, pay attention. And this theorem of Gromov about the existence of closed geodesics on Riemannian manifolds with uh, unsolvable word problem fundamental groups. Wow, that's a long run on sentence. Listen to this again, slower. I'm sorry, I'm going too fast. I'm feeling some time pressure, I guess. Uh, anyway, so that's um, an, an example. So I think that persistence homology of functionals is something that should be studied. Redoing what Sarah did about computing homology of function spaces, trying to understand the persistent homology of function spaces, I think is actually important. Uh, um, let's see, another direction that came up in applied stuff that I think is really important, I mean, that people would be studying for other reasons is random topology. Uh, so there's stuff, you know, in my paper with Miyogi and Smale, we studied, you know, how many points at random, you know, that if you have enough points at random, you could compute the homology. Our estimates about how many points you needed were pretty incompetent, but good enough for the purpose. I mean, it was, a, you know, it was an exponential, and we now know that in the limit, the base of the exponential is smaller than the one we did. And that was hard work. Um, but there, you know, a... Uh, but there's sort of all sorts of other kinds of random topology, um, you know, that come up like in the topology of quasi crystals, uh, where there's a statistical, where there's a different statistical source, and the analog of that would be leaves of foliations on compact manifolds. And there, so I think that there's sort of uh, room for interesting analogies between um, topology of leaves, uh, Benjamin, Mini, Schramm convergence. Um, disordered matter and things like that. And I think that some of the ideas in applied to topology and geometry uh, should feed back into pure math. I mean, a lot of it sort of is. I mean, there, I, you know, there certain theorems and certain random group models or ra random Martin groups, random this, random that, uh, you know, some of them were motivated by trying to uh, think about what is the null hypothesis that we're rejecting when we do TDA. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm thinking that, you know, that kind of mathematics, you know, will be, you know, will there, I think there's room for a lot of development for a pure mathematics, some of which, uh, will have applied, uh, applied advantages, but, um, I don't know. Um, oh, I can mention another one, uh, like dimension reduction. Dimension reduction is again, something that we, uh, use a lot. Um, I'm very, you know, and the question then is when you have a manifold and you try to embed it in another metric space or Euclidean space, um, what is the kind of distortion? And so there's, of course, a lot of interest in embedding in various Banach spaces going on for computer science reasons. Uh, this kind of thing occurs. I'm kind of really happy in my paper with Fedya on quantitative null cobordism. Uh, we managed to hijack or apply or steal or something. We did something to some work of Gromov and Guth, which I think is a real advance over what people usually do. I mean, most of what people a lot of times do for dimension reduction is a one scale Johnson Linden Strauss, but this idea of Gromov and Guth uh, was a two scale thing. And uh, Fedya and I uh, were able to use that for um, feeding into work of Renee Tom to be able to make more quantitative analogs. So I, I think that there are just zillions of questions. Uh, typically, when we want to apply something in quantitative topology, it's not enough to know that something exists. You want to know something about the thing that exists. Um, and, uh, and very often, when you know what the thing exists, some cycle exists, right? But then finding the representative of the cycle, if there is a best representative, or understanding the aggregate of all the representatives, you know, or the optimi optimized version, I mean, those become really important either for doing calculations or for understanding the significance of what you're looking at or how significant what you're looking at is, right? There's an optimum, but if it turns out that the persistent interval that defines why that optimum is optimal, if it's a small interval, then it's maybe not a very robust thing, et cetera. I mean, I think that everybody who's listening probably could say this better than I just did. 
So just one final thing. Uh, are there any current, so what current and future directions within applied topology particularly excite you? So you've sort of covered this already, but is there anything else you'd like to add? Billions of things. I mean, there, I think that uh, there are lots and lots of things that, um, so let, I'm, I'll mention a couple. Uh, so one of the th things that I think is really an interesting direction or what I'd like to see is more work on this. Maybe that's, um, you That's know, a good interpretation. Uh, yeah, I mean, is inspired by the ideas of property testing in computer science. For example, when you want to study properties of networks, uh, say the internet, you're not going to be, it's not a good idea to try to sample the whole internet. You don't want to ask, is the internet connected? Because if there's one node somewhere that's not connected to everything, you just decide there's another component. Taking a census of those would be very costly. So you don't want to ask what's H0 of the internet. You want to go ahead and, you know, a, it's just not at all practical. So you're interested really in what are the kinds of things that can be computed with limited amounts of data up approximately with high probability. Right. I mean, there's something or other. So now there's some things that you could do of that sort, um, you know, by statistically sampling, say, oh, I'm not going to, you know, I'll just ask local questions and I'll take the patterns, et cetera, et cetera. Um, those aren't the most interesting. So here's an example. So I told you I have a three valent graph. It's, I have a regular, right? It's a regular graph. It's three valent. And I want to know uh, what is H1? Well, you're not going to compute H1, but uh, you just can't. But so I'm, I'm going to ask you, what is H1? divided by the number of vertices, okay? So some of you already know the answer, uh, but let, let, you know, but suppose what you would do is this, you say, well, I don't know what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sample a point at random and I'm gonna look at a ball of radius 50 and I'm gonna see how many cycles I see in that ball. Well, the thing is this, if the number of vertices is really large, that ball is always gonna look like a tree and you're not gonna see any cycles at all. On the other hand, if you're smart and know about Euler characteristic and you said that this was a connected graph or it had no small, not too many small components or whatever, then what you would immediately know is that that number is more or less, you know, it's, a, you know, the Euler, you know, the Euler characteristic you could compute from the local structure and, you know, it's three valent. And so it, you know, it, it's some number. I don't know what the number is, two. Well, I don't know, the tetrahedron. Well, anyway, you can figure it out yourself. Uh, so anyway, so that's something that you do not by statistical sampling, but still by knowing the statistical samples, you could compute things. So that's sort of one example. I would say, uh, what are computable invariants uh, for large things? And that has obvious connections to material science. It should have relevance to you know, all sorts of data. Um, another direction I would say is using Hodge theory um, in combination with persistence. Uh, just, I'll just comment. Hodge theory says your cycles are associated to the zero of the spectrum of the Laplacian, uh, the kernel of the spectrum. So instead of, you know, instead of asking about small bars, you, you could ask, oh, well, what about the spectrum near zero? So that's sort of near cycles in some sense. It's a different notion of near cycle than you see coming up uh, in what we usually do. Um, I think that understanding the relations and how you combine them with each other could be potentially very valuable. Um, I heard a beep, so my suggest thought is that that means that I talk too long. Hi, so Henry, are we up to questions? Yeah, I'll jump in and ask um, ask three questions or so, if that's okay. So the first question is on um, advising. It, you know, on math genealogy, I can see you've you've helped at least nineteen uh, graduate students receive their PhDs. So I'm curious on thoughts you have for advising graduate students. But also, there's a question on the chat. Um, any advice about being a mentor for young researchers? This person is currently mentoring an undergraduate for the first time and discovering it's in it's complicated in ways they didn't imagine. Okay. Um, first of all, I love giving advice. And secondly, yeah, I don't believe in giving advice. Okay. Ah. Uh, so, and that's my approach to mentoring too. Okay. So now let me try to un un unpack that. So um, one day I noticed when I was, I had two graduate students who were having their weekly meeting with me in, in, in my office in consecutive hours. Uh, and I remember what, the first one came into my office and he was telling me about his ideas. And I said, uh, X, come on, you know, this, you know, your ideas, I'm not, I don't even want to talk about them so much. 
But, you know, you haven't read the literature at all. I mean, this is an old problem. It's a hard problem. Very, very smart people have been working on this for decades. You know, your idea, you know, it obviously has, you know, it's an interesting idea. It's new, but like, why don't you at least pay attention to what other smart people did so you could see their pitfalls? Because I don't see that you're dealing with any of the serious obstacles in the way. Then next student comes in and you know he's also working on a hard problem. And he begins telling me about all the papers he's been reading. And then I said, Joe, not real name, Joe, you know, you're not going to make progress by doing the same thing that everybody else is doing. You know, I mean, all these smart people tried those things and those things didn't work. Why, in the, why do you think you're going to do better than them? And then on the way home, I was reviewing my day and I realized that I said two exactly opposite things uh, to the students who were both working on hard problems. Um, but I realized that there's no law of non-contradiction when it comes to advice. I mean, it, this is what Fermi called a deep truth. A deep truth is something that's true, whose negation is also true. And, you know, so it's true. Work, you know, a, you know, work on, you know, work on your own original ideas. And then it's also understand what everybody else did, et cetera, right? I mean, you know, I mean, I'm constantly telling people get good collaborators, but of course, in the end, you know, mathematics gets done in your brain. You can't, you know, you should be suspicious of any part of your joint work that you don't understand. Oh, I'm relying on the other person. Uh, so anyway, so that's, you know, par part of the idea of advice. So with respect to students, I would say that I don't, each student I had a really different relationship with. I mean, it wasn't a function of me and that I have a policy and that I just, you know, do things. Uh, I remember one of my students, he lived in my neighborhood. It's a, about a 45 minute drive from the university. So I told him, you're going to get to talk to me for three hours a week because you're going to commute with me both directions two days a week. I would drive and he would have to explain things to me orally without any paper while I was driving. He didn't use the full three hours, but he was forced to think conceptually. He got more time than any other student, but he got zero Blackboard time. Uh, and, but that worked really, really well for him. Uh, you know, I mean, at, in my, my view is it worked well with him. I mean, you could interview him later. I'll <laughs> tell you his name. You could find out whether he liked, the, liked that method. Uh, but I, mean, I, I don't think that I did a great job with, with all of my students. There are students who I'm very proud of. Uh, I won't mention any name other than Kate. Uh, but uh, but like in Kate's case, I don't know that I gave her particularly good advice. I told her, look, you're doing applied stuff. I don't know anything applied. You better learn how to compute. You better learn some statistics. You better learn all the things I don't know because uh, firstly, I want to learn them from you. I probably didn't say that part out loud. Uh, but the part I said out loud is that I don't know them and you want to do this for a living and you need to know these if you're going to be competent. And you know, Kate was fantastic uh, that way. Um, uh, I apologize for violating confidentiality here, Kate. It's, you know, uh, oh, that's okay. You know, uh, I very uh, much enjoyed our chats. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I, you know, so my way of doing it, which might not be other people's, uh, like my colleague Benson Farb has had many more students than I, and he has a routine about how he deals with each of his students. And he has weekly meetings with them, and he has a notebook where he takes notes about what their conversation was. But he has. <laughs> He has a good system. I'm not systematic. Uh, so it's helpful to like the person you're working with. I mean, I think that that's sort of, uh, you know, usually a good thing. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I, I probably veered off the question. Do you want to ask it again or did I answer? No, it? no, you, uh, that's perfect. I'll, I'll ask a totally different question. So okay. how have you found success if you have? balancing math research and professional commitments with your personal life and hobbies. And so in, in the chat, it says, have you converged to a strategy that's better than just winging it? No, I have no good strategy. So first, let me say that, okay, at my friend Steve's 60th birthday, I mean, my talk at his, you know, my toast, so to speak, was, uh, the pleasure I had with Steve, I mean, he's one of my long-term collaborators. I mean, I also have about 15 papers with him. So we're talking about Steve Ferry. Uh, I, I don't know if he remembers this. He'll now remember it, if, if, you know, because now it's immortalized. Uh, 
but at, at the banquet, I, I sort of talked about, uh, we tried to prove an overcup conjecture. We did some cases and failed. Uh, we, were, we, did, we studied homology manifolds, but we couldn't prove their homogeneity. And you know, I talked about that, you know, everything that I did with Steve, you know, ended up being a failure. I mean, that, you know, we never achieved our goals. Uh, and I kind of think that that's about right. I, you know, and, you know, my, my time with Steve, I, I thought of, you know, I, I loved our failures. I mean, we learned so much from it. I mean, there were very, you know, there were various successes on the way, but, you know, the, you know, I mean, yeah, I, I'm, you know, I mean, I, I'm infinitely voracious and I just want more so that, you know, I, so yeah, I don't feel like a t terrific success. I, uh, there's a mathematician I think of as what, based on conversations with him, I think, wow, he's smarter than Gauss. And then I think, oh, he must feel like such a failure because he has, you know, he's really done only like a quarter as good as Gauss. You know, like poor guy. You know, I mean, I mean, you know, so yeah, so I don't, I can't say that I found success. Um, I've been working on being more satisfied with, you know, living with being a failure. Uh, and, you know, I, you know, not in some absolute sense. I, you know, I mean, you know, you give it a try. 90% uh, of what I work on doesn't work. And I, you know, therefore try to figure out what did I learn? Why didn't this work? Uh, you know, I, uh, you know, so yeah, I'm not gonna, you know, I, I'm very proud of my kids. I, 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 yeah, but I don't think that I found really a great balance between work and family. Um, I kind of wish I spent more time at home. Uh, I have a real habit of when I have spare capacity, it feels like a market inefficiency and that I should be you know, selling it as a bond on the open market or, uh, you know, so uh, I'm still working on figuring out, you know, how to balance things, uh, how to get enough space um, to not be so frazzled. Um, but uh, yeah, so I think that my solution to, to that was, I just try a lot of things and expect to fail at, at some of them. Um, it's really great that my wife accepts the fact that I am far from the, you know, from the perfect family man. And she's been very devoted uh, to helping me and giving me plenty of rope uh, to, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to do the best I can. Thanks. So, so one last question, uh, I think, given your role as chair and editor and, and board member. So uh, the question in the chat is, what are your thoughts of the effects of the pandemic on the math community, both short term and long term, negatives and positives? And I know that's a difficult question, but if you have any, any thoughts. Yeah. So it's a good I thing we prepared for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, so I, mean, I don't think that we know. OK, first of all, I mean, this is, you know, we're in the midst of it. We don't know how long it's going to go on. Um, you know, we, 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 um, it, it's really very hard. I think that, you know, there are, there are many people whose physical health, uh, ha, you know, I mean, there, there are certainly many, many people who have died. Um, there, you know, I mean, it's been the mental health uh, issues that this has caused are really enormous. There is sort of a lot of strain. I, I'm very happy about the growth of Zoom and that we're able to connect despite this. Uh, for me personally, um, it really bothers me. I don't think I've made any friends since COVID has started. And, uh, you know, I, you know, I've been spending many, many hours at home and, you know, I talk to collaborators and friends and, you know, things go on. I, you know, I, I feel so much for the graduate students and for young faculty or people who move to new places, you know, I mean, out, you know, they don't have, you know, they're forced to go ahead and, you know, try to build things in, I think, a very inauspicious environment. And I think that that's, you know, really hard and that, you know, we have to, we as a community, uh, granting agencies, foundations have to go ahead and they're, they're trying. I mean, I think NSF is increasing the number of postdocs. There are various things that can be done, which 
are band-aids on really deep wounds. Um, and I don't, you know, I think this is going to be a this is a, a very hard time that will take a long time to heal from. Um, I'm very curious to see what ha what the role of Zoom and conferences and workshops are going to be like afterwards. I, I mean, I keep I know that it's so important for us to see each other face to face and really spend time in terms of developing new relationships. It used to be that when I would go someplace for a week, I would get to meet graduate students. I might, you know, I find out what young people are working on, and, and that's that's a joy. And you know, that isn't happening, at least for me anymore. I'm not so good at these breakout rooms and teas and stuff. I mean, personally, uh, but on the other hand, you know, because of the environment I could, and all sorts of other pressures, I could see that people are going to do less traveling, given that there are options to do so. And I think that, you know. Smart people should be thinking about uh, ways which we can, you know, improve our personal thing. I don't know. Will, you think Oculus will help us, and our virtual stuff will be so good we don't actually need to travel? I don't know, but I think that we, you know, we really need the personal, uh, the personal touch. I fear that uh, that things that develop through COVID uh, will, even after COVID, result in us being. Uh, less directly in touch with each other, and that I fear as being a second order uh, long term effect. I hope that, you know, that time proves me wrong and that, you know, that everything will just be roses and daisies. So, uh, yeah, so there, I would say some small good, but, you know, but overall not worth it. Well, thanks for sharing your thoughts. I'll pass it back to Elkanan to close this out. Okay, thank you, Henry. So, um, so yes, thank you very much, Drs. Turner and Weinberger for the incredibly interesting and engaging interview. You've given us a lot of ideas to reflect upon and uh, to think about. Thanks also to the audience for joining us today and for your thoughtful questions. And we hope to see all of you in March when Robert Grice will be interviewed by Radmila Sazanovich. <laughs>